Hello and welcome to our session here on uh, how CCP Games uses AWS to put the internet into internet spaceships. Uh, my name is Arnie. I'm a developer advocate at uh, AWS uh, Amazon Web Services and AWS, and I'm uh, focusing on game tech. I've been with AWS for four years, and uh, first as a solutions architect and then as a developer advocate. And I've been lucky to, to be able to, to work with games customers across the, the Nordics and across EMEA. And I'm joined today by Nick Herring, who's the technical director of infrastructure for E Online at CCP Games. Um, and in this session, I'm going to be starting by giving you a brief introduction uh, to AWS and to Game Tech and the services that we provide for building and hosting games. And then we're going to switch gears as I hand it over to Nick, and he's going to tell you a compressed recap of CCP Games' journey so far in adopting AWS including why they've chosen the, the route that they did and some of the spike pits that they encountered on the way. Um, so for those of you who might not be familiar, AWS is a global provider of cloud services, and we help games and, and game studios provision the core building blocks of infrastructure. So whether that's compute, storage, databases, networking, or, or security services, and we do this through an on-demand pay-as-you-go model, and, and this is called the AWS Cloud. Now, the AWS Cloud runs currently in 24 different, different geographical regions around the world, and five more regions have been announced. And within these regions, you'll find 77 different availability zones that give you the possibility to run highly available and highly redundant workloads. Now, as an on-demand service, the Cloud enables game studios to react quickly to, to changes and, and, um, and player feedback and changes in demand. And um, it does that by providing the elasticity to provision resources on demand when you need them. And so ultimately, we help clear the way for you to really focus on, on what differenti differentiates you and, and your company, which is building great games and innovating on gameplay. Now, we help companies of all stages and sizes, and whether they're just starting out or if they have millions of players playing their game, and some of the common use cases that we see our, our customers solving using AWS are backend services, databases and analytics, and machine learning and AI, and of course, uh, many more. But if we dive a little bit into these, um, so, so first, let's talk about the, the, the backend services. When it comes to compute, we often talk about raw compute power, and, and often the, the game servers are the first solution that you hear about in that context. And AWS Game Tech gives you the flexibility to choose the route that is best suited for your needs. So if you have AWS uh, competency, then you can create customized server infrastructure in the cloud and really maintain full control over your, your environment. And you can use services like Amazon Elastic Compute Cloud, EC2, for virtual machines. Uh, you can use the Elastic Container Service, ECS, or the Elastic Kubernetes Service, EKS, for deploying game servers and, and backends in containers. And of course, there's AWS Lambda and AWS Fargate for serverless workloads and, and serverless uh, containers. Then you can also choose a, a fully managed service like Amazon GameLift, which will provide you with a low cost, low latency server uh, or, or fleets of servers for, for session-based multiplayer games. Now with Amazon GameLift, you can deploy and operate and scale these dedicated game servers. And it's a, it's a fully managed service. It's, it's meant for session-based games and it really leverages the power and the reliability of AWS. So um, you know, deploying uh, game servers into, into multiple regions around the world, and also providing you with game-specific features such as matchmaking players to play together and also scaling the system based on the amount of game sessions that are being played by the players. So that's all taken care of with GameLift. Now, in, in databases and, and analytics, games today, they succeed based on their ability to listen to their players and learn what the players want and really deliver at, at a moment's notice. And, but the bigger the games get, the more data they generate. And understanding all of this data allows you to continue to grow and, and retain your player base and make better design decisions with analytics. And so through AWS services like Amazon Aurora, Amazon Neptune, the Kinesis Data Firehose, games like Fortnite are able to store petabytes of player data in the cloud and analyze it in real time, helping them make key decisions to improve the gameplay. Machine learning is, is a popular area as well. As a, as a next iteration, after having created analytics pipelines and collected quality data about usage of the game, you can start taking advantage of machine learning capabilities in the AWS platform. And we have customers that are using Amazon SageMaker for analyzing massive data sets and identifying patterns to help surface game-breaking bugs and to balance issues in, in multiplayer games. 
We also have customers that are using AWS machine learning services to detect and isolate cheaters and to look at usage patterns to predict when players are likely to be churning or, or leaving the game. And this is just an, a selection of the games customers who rely on the AWS infrastructure. So more than 90% of the world's biggest public game companies, including Activision, Supercell, and, and Ubisoft, are using AWS. And our customers are global, and they span everything from these AAA studios to two or three person indie studios, so all sizes. And um, you know, whether you're a team of, of one or, or 1,000, there's really only one thing that matters, and it's making a game that players want to play. And how you get there is the real question. So game tech provides you with a, a robust and scalable technology uh, for every stage in your game's life, life cycle. So whether you're in development mode, you're creating the game, or, or if you're already running and you're collecting analytics. And you can choose to build your game on the managed services to, to scale or use the core AWS services. And our focus is just to be the, the most customer obsessed company in the games industry. So before I welcome Nick uh, from CCP Games to take over uh, and tell us what their journey has looked like so far, let me give you a quick overview of the other sessions that we are running here at, uh, at Nordic Game. So we have a number of great sessions. We have, a, a, including this session, obviously, and then we have a live Q&A session on inclusion and why that matters. We also have a half day of technical sessions that are available as video on demand. And they include creating an analytics pipeline for games, multiplayer game server hosting, uh, using containers for backends and, and game servers, um, creating a churn prediction model using machine learning, a deep dive into serverless technologies and uh, how to uh, create a presence API using serverless. And last but not least, how voice has become the new controller and how you can utilize that in your game. So with that, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Nick Herring from CCP Games to tell us the journey of uh, adopting AWS for EVE Online. Let me switch here the presentation. All right. Thanks for joining us, Nick, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Andre. Uh, so again, my name is Nick. I'm the, the technical director of infrastructure at CCP Games, uh, specifically for EVE Online. Um, and uh, so CCP Games have a, has a lot of different projects. We use AWS in a lot of different ways, but specifically EVE Online is an interesting story because we started using it in various forms and degrees over time um, as you know, we're taking EVE Online, which is a massively multiplayer uh, online uh, space opera, some call it. Uh, some people refer to it as spreadsheets in space. Uh, we also lovingly refer to it as the friendship machine. Um, and this is uh, basically a, a sci-fi MMO set thousands of years in the future. Um, and it's been live since 2003. Um, and so like, if, if you want to get an idea of what EVE is like for our players, uh, there's a great, uh, one of my, my personally favorite videos that we have uh, on YouTube about uh, basically what, what it's, it's a video about like live recordings of our players playing EVE online in certain situations that have been kind of, uh, uh, let's say dramatically reenacted with our renderer. Um, and you can check that out in the, in the bottom right uh, with the QR code there. Um, and so more for the, the technical aspect of EVE, uh, since it's been running since 2003, this was evolving since then. Ultimately, like this is a representation of kind of the code base uh, in 2004. Uh, and again, there's a, there's a video showing this timeline uh, online as well. And then if you kind of check between these two here, it evolves greatly in between these. Like this is just the deltas into 2016. Uh, so uh, Eve is roughly 2.2 million lines of, of Python. Uh, and I, I don't actually know the total count of the C++ itself, uh, but there is much more Python code than there is C++ code. Um, and so uh, with this kind of evolution of, of how Eve has been running and growing and, and working, uh, you know, it's 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 been a challenge to look at uh, these new technologies uh, like Cube and Docker and try to adapt Eve Online to to work with these these technology or, or just to see what we can use in the near term to try to, to work with those pieces. Um, 
for the for the server side, this is basically our generic our general architecture for for how Eve Online works. Uh, in in the center of everything is basically we have a we have a massive MSSQL server uh, that is the heart of everything. Originally, CCP uh, when they were building Eve Online had two hammers. Uh, those hammers were uh, basically uh, DBAs and uh, network engineers. Uh, and I found out by accident when adding like GOIP information to some of our services that we are actually an ISP. We actually have our own ASN. Uh, and that's how far kind of CCP games was going to make sure they had their players had good connectivity uh, and, and, and latency to, to basically their main servers. Uh, the other piece of that is the MSSQL part of it. And, and there are, I think we're in the seven to 8,000 range of procs that are basically powering all of EVE Online. Um, and, and again, th that's that's a bulk of the, the logic for the longest time that was that was used in, in the game itself. Um, now, outside of that, we have what we call our soul servers. The soul servers are, they operate the, the services that could be from, uh, you know, when you dock in a station and you want to operate something like if you want to buy and sell in the market or you want to go into industry and start building things. Uh, the other big thing that the soul service is responsible for is the simulation aspect of, of space. So when you're out actually flying in space uh, and simulating those events and interactions between other players. Uh, and then the next connectivity point is basically the proxies that surround the soul server. So our players connect into our proxies. And this is mostly a, a, a firewall or a, an authoritative barrier into the soul servers because once we're on the soul servers, we assume that that's the authoritative calls on what's actually happening in that scenario. Um, the other thing to be clear about is that Eve Online is a single universe. So they're, they're, uh, the universe of New Eden uh, is basically run on our public server uh, for most of the world called Tranquility. And that is a single shard. There is no, we have no regional in anything. So that's another interesting advantage and disadvantages in some cases uh, when working with uh, services like AWS, because a lot of the techniques and concepts are, are relying on uh, not necessarily availability zones, but actually cross region replication and, and how you work with that information for us all roads lead to a single database and that's where the interactivity happens and that's kind of one of the things that makes eve unique is that over since 2003 players have been building an actual persistent legacy over time uh, and that's where they all connect to and that's where they all interact uh, so you like if you do get into eve and that's kind of why we call it the friendship machine because once you're in there everyone's in the same world and, and that they're, they're sharing all of those pieces over time and so with, with this setup, what's kind of happened originally with how EVE was architected is, is it's the, you know, the, in the code base itself, there's these standard concepts of like service oriented architecture and those ideas. But the interesting part that happened is those software ideas were way ahead of the operations concepts at the time. And so now we're more into DevOps and everything's lambdas or containers or both or whatever nothing has a server everyone is on somebody else's server it, and all of these concepts right um, but that kind of never caught up with the how the, the the systems were designed originally so we have a single data center with all of this happening and one of the interesting side effects of that is that the the eve cluster itself uh, basically became a, a the best definition i've heard of it internally that we have so far is, is a guaranteed one hop mesh network um, which is awesome until you think about the scaling aspect of that because it becomes quadratic uh, and that's problematic. Uh, and this means that it, when you're guaranteeing a one hop in a mesh network, you have to have connections to everything and everything has the connections to everything else. Um, and so this is part of the piece that plays into the concepts of why we can't necessarily just uh, quote unquote lift and shift into a cloud provider. Uh, we have to basically find these boundaries and where we can pull pieces off and, and where they make sense and ultimately start teasing apart the bits that the, the, the design of the software still is applicable to the concepts of what we have as operations today. Um, and so while we were doing that, uh, it's basically, you know, <laughs> what parts of the universe didn't fit into the cloud? And uh, like I said earlier, CCP Games is using AWS all over the place. And but where we start, where we started first with Eve Online was around the CDNs and CloudFront. 
we originally had the concept of like, yep, here's your here's your one gig installer download, have fun. Uh, then we started exploring the idea of you know binary differencing and patching those things. And our current imp implementation is uh, what we've called the download on demand and, and binaries on demand, which is ultimately uh, we just put everything onto S3, and then of course that serves through CloudFront. Um, and we we basically put all of the assets that the client could possibly know about, and then when those assets are needed, they're streamed down to the client. So ultimately, it's it's the concept of you know when you're installing a game, it's like hey, you can start playing now, but you won't have everything until this point. But it's important that uh, you get into space, get into the game as quickly as possible. And so that's kind of one of the the first big uses of AWS that we have. Um, and that has also you know caused some challenges as well with a with a sandbox game like Eve Online ultimately because we get to the point of okay well you're ready to play at this point however after that point you can go and do almost anything in the universe so even even those paradigms don't necessarily work for us in certain situations where we have people who are being fast tracked through other friends playing the game who are getting them into their you know in game corporations and alliances and those kind of things um, but also to note before I go on into the specific Eve stuff, like there's other projects that we've had that are using other things like like lambdas and uh, a lot of the serverless tech and uh, you know more managed services than we are in Eve Online. And we'll we'll get a bit more into that as we go. But ultimately, we've taken a minimalistic approach with Eve Online simply because of the the density of Eve Online. Like there's a level of complexity there, but there's just so much that actually is in Eve Online as far as a feature set is concerned um where we basically just need to draw lines in the sand to figure out what we can carve out and what we can't um so the initial the initial work was done with cdns and that doesn't really there's not really a real-time component to it that's not you know interacting or integrating with anything particularly that's just part of the build pipeline uh, so then we started looking at the the supplementary services um, and the first one that we looked at was search and, and for that we started using elastic search um, and basically feeding all of our data into that. Prior to that, we were using, I think we we're using Sphinx uh, in our own data center. Uh, and we we basically, this is one of those cases where when you're experimenting with a cloud provider like AWS, you have to make the cases of, let, let's try this and see what this looks like. What, like what comes out of this? What can we learn from this experience of, of detaching these pieces uh, and then uh, uh, switching back and forth between the two? So, so search was one of the first ones that we did. Uh, we also have character portraits, uh, which is tied to the CDNs, but there's basically a, a service that we have which uh, loads information from a system that we call the paper doll uh, system, which is where people create their characters and pose them and uh, sculpt their faces and, and you know put on clothing, those kind of things. Um, and that was used quite heavily initially. I think this was in 2011 when we released this uh, to make a lot of familiar faces. As you can see, there's some of them. Uh, the coincidentally, the funny part here is that uh, the internal name for the service was actually called Paparazzi. Uh, but again, this is this is one of those services that we tried to pull out, and, and this is what we're we're just running it on EC2 instances. It's getting information to then render these portraits and then forwarding those into S3, then back by CloudFront, those kind of things. So this was, we were getting closer and closer into to more real time components with with search and the character portraits. But the point being here is that if these services were malfunctioning or the migration didn't go well or the switch, it wasn't the end of the world. Like our players couldn't, like it didn't stop people from, from flying around in space. And, and that was kind of an important first step for us in moving into those pieces. Um, the other big piece that we started was the development pipelines uh, because there was a lot of mixed infrastructure as far as like our internal corporate infrastructure with Office IT, also pieces where things like uh we like i i'm pretty sure every company has this but there was a box underneath somebody's desk somewhere that was doing something important to the build pipeline we had to go find all of those things uh but ultimately like moving all of this into aws you know this moved us into things uh where we're using uh build fleets uh, that are composed of, of windows and linux and, and they're both container enabled amis and that's became super important for us because uh you know we wanted we wanted these hermetically sealed uh, build pipelines where we could reproduce these things and that gets a bit tricky because no matter how you look at it when you're developing when you're developing a, a video game your game client will always be this massive monolith uh, and so wrangling all of those pieces from middleware to 
the proprietary software and all of those things consistently uh, and, and, and with some speed becomes problematic if you don't have a way to kind of orchestrate that. And so one of the things that we first gravitated towards was uh, basically having uh, our build fleets be on EC2. We also explored uh, dealing with reservations and those types of things. And just to kind of go through that, we roughly have 16,000 active build configurations. We use Team City currently. Uh, and for the builds, there's probably about 78,000 a month, roughly 2,000 builds a day. Uh, ultimately, uh, we wound up with a fleet of 60 agents, 55 of those are EC2 instances, and those are spun up and spun down based on whether or not we need Linux at the time or Windows at the time or, or a mix of, of, of both. Um, and so we started looking at roughly what was the, what was the time that it took to, to build, to, to, how much time are we utilizing with these pieces? And, and ultimately that broke down into the fact that we couldn't really like, we looked into how do we save costs on those agents? We couldn't really reserve those instances because the math just didn't work out. Like the, the, you know, the agents would spin up on demand when we needed them. So everybody would start, you know, committing things into Perforce and that would start triggering a bunch of builds and all sorts of good stuff. And the build would start off in the mornings for like, it, you know the nightly builds those pieces to make sure if we were if we had like hot fixes or whatever the case may be and then of course all that would die off around six seven o'clock at night somewhere around in there um, and so we couldn't really switch to reserve instances uh so then we tried out spot fleets um, but spot fleets didn't really work out for us either uh because funny thing about spot fleets is everybody goes to work at the same time uh, so ultimately when we had these spot fleets, spot fleets that would come online they would all be shot in the head almost immediately as soon as other companies came online in the same region that we were in in AWS. And so that didn't really work for us either. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, this is one of the, you know, one of the things that Adekne was talking about earlier with the spike traps, this is one of them. Um, spot fleets are, are tricky for these kind of on-demand scenarios where you need them in, in very specific times and they can't, like once they're started, they can't really die kind of situation. And, and we've had very long conversations about this with, with AWS in, in these pieces, but there's tricky parts that just the math doesn't work. Uh, where, you know, we need, we our, our build pipeline is heavy on Windows. It takes anywhere from six to eight minutes to spin up a, a Windows instance. Uh, but then on your spot links, you get a two minute warning on the shutdown. Uh, so uh, not really enough time to cope with those things. Uh, so that's one of the first kind of the struggles that we kind of came in to, into contact with with AWS and those pieces. So at this point in time, we're, we're still running on on, on demand uh, and that's okay uh, because of the nature of, of how we're doing these builds. Um, but then the other big piece of, of what we're using uh, AWS for is that uh, we use Perforce uh, for, the, for the primary game development pieces. So the, the, the server and the client uh, specifically uh, and all of the art uh, all the content, asset generation, all of those pieces. And so the, the the most important thing that we did when we started moving these build agents into AWS and using EC2 is that we had to have a Perforce proxy online in uh, AWS as well. And so uh, there's, a, you know, eight graphs here, the top four are from our on-prem, you know, Perforce actual versus the, the proxy that's in AWS at the bottom there. And as you can see, there's a di very different usage pattern as far as like how much is writing to disk and how much is pulling. Um, but ultimately, you know, with our, this is a C5 extra large uh, with, uh, I think it's a, yeah, one terabyte IO1. Because um, once we turned this on, we realized we were hitting like uh, the, the quota limits on IOPS versus the quota limits that are coupled with the instance uh, for the network throughput. Uh, and so we just had to keep cranking that up until we found, you know, where we stopped like plateauing as far as disks, reads, and network was concerned. Uh, but this became a super important thing for us because it, it got to the point where our, you know, our fleet of 55 build agents would come online and they would just be able to siphon all the data off of the proxies. Uh, and that, that was absolutely necessary because there's no way we'd be able to do that over, I think at that time was VPN connections that was pre-transit gateway, uh, those types of things. And so this was the other aspect that we kind of uh, worked towards adopting pieces of, of, of AWS and kind of uh, surrounding our existing uh, architecture with, with various services and components from these pieces where uh, this kind of illustrates, you know, the search aspects, the character portraits uh, being processed in EC2, the build agents, Perforce proxy, all that, all those things outputting to S3 and all that going into download demand to, to get that content uh, to our players. And so, 
the next piece of this kind of became how do we partition these, uh, how do we partition more of the real time components uh, to interact with the, the core mechanisms of EVE Online? And ultimately the answer to that is, is a message bus. And for us, the, the message bus is our, it's our escape hatch uh, from tons of legacy, uh, from again, the 2.2 million lines of Python uh, into other technologies. I mean, we, we basically skipped over the entire generation of, of virtual machines in a sense, and just jumped straight into containers and Kubernetes and those pieces. Um, but the message bus was super important to us because ultimately it, it highlighted the fact that we needed we needed all of these tools for uh, communicating with one another and doing that with proprietary pieces while adopting other you know uh, cloud services from AWS, we needed to change how we communicate those. Uh, so a ubiquitous language was very important for us. Um, and so the ubiquitous language that we wound up using uh, was ultimately uh, Protobuf. We, we started with JSON. But then we quickly regretted that as time moved on, and we we realized that you know a proper schema and and a mechanism for everybody to communicate uh, on the same page with a ubiquitous language became super important. And of course, there's JSON schema and various things like that. But then there's other concepts that we had in mind where we wanted to look towards in the future, which we'll get to in a second about how we connected these services together. But but for this phase of of how we were working with the the, the services, it was ultimately like how do we get how do we get things to the message bus and how do we get everybody to understand everything that's on the message bus? And that became a uh, protobuf. And, and in our case, we, we simplified this because we, we basically started doing uh, event sourcing concepts and, and uh, CQRS concepts. Uh, so command query responsibility separation, I always get one of those wrong. Um, and that basically gave us our four primitives of uh, events, requests, responses, and notices. Um, and so with our data center, we ultimately needed to connect those pieces uh, from our data center to the core pieces of the universe that are that are being simulated or the services for the, for the universe that are in the data center and connect that to the message bus. And so we're running RabbitMQ uh, clusters uh, through Terraform in EC2, and that's being connected. Uh, we have different ways of connecting those. There's, we're using transit gateways to come into the offices or come in from the offices uh, into our VPCs, uh, and then we also have um, just direct connect coming from our data center into uh, our Amazon accounts uh, to connect into the, the RabbitMQ cluster itself. And so the other important part of this, this kind of evolution of how we're working with these pieces is ultimately uh, we want to be able to connect as many pieces to this ubiquitous language. So we, you know, we want to see our, our websites that are able to communicate with this, and this isn't coming until a little bit later next year, I think, uh, but it opens the door for a lot of other things. Like this was a huge uh, uh, component to our, our companion app. Uh, this is how uh, Eve portal communicates with the rest of the cluster and, and how it understands what's going on and, and can interact that way. Um, there's also kind of our third party APIs, um, which is a, uh, it's like a, a Swagger Spec Open API generated uh, API that, that players use to basically self-organize and, and it, it, they use it as a tool to help them manage tens of thousands of other players uh, that, they, that they're in the same like alliance or corporation. Um, but ultimately, we, we currently have the connection of, of basically the clients, the, the people who are piloting all this good spaceship stuff, uh, connecting directly to our data center. Uh, what we're trying to get to is to have this connection established to the message bus itself. Um, and ultimately that, that gets back into the other technologies that we're looking into with AWS and how we, how we accomplish that connectivity. Um, but first, kind of the message bus piece is, is important there because we have to break down domain boundaries. And like I was saying earlier, a lot of the software design for EVE Online made sense in those pieces, but Ultimately, it got blurred by the operational components of it. The fact that we have a single massive MSSQL database is, is one of those side effects, right? Uh, and so we have to then understand how to tease apart those pieces of understanding uh, where we can break those apart. And, and the tricky part there is, is kind of what the, the, the monolithic amenities that we have versus the cohesion of the data itself. And this kind of gets 
this is a whole this could be a whole topic in and of itself of, of coupling both versus cohesion but the 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 most obvious version of coupling for us is the is the amenities that our developers are used to in the monolith itself so how do we provide them with uh the the ability to say okay you're not part of the primary database you have your own database and you own all your own data which opens the doors for a lot of other things but also has these scary side effects of everything falling into devops right where people have to think about a little bit more about how they own their data and how they work with those pieces um, the other piece of partitioning the universe comes into the the fact that we have uh, services uh so far not simulation so we've been focusing on on, on services and, and, and the pieces around those services so um other more uh, real-time examples of this is uh chat uh we run an eJeopardy cluster inside of amazon uh, on ec2 uh we have a a feature called activity tracker uh, which is basically a discovery mechanism and uh, a ledger for what players activities in, in the universe are uh, and that uses the message bus heavily to track all of those pieces. Uh, we have certain leaderboards in place, uh, which goes off into services that are running into running in Kubernetes with their own data stores using uh, RDS and Postgres, um, and, and other uh, caching mechanisms like Redis as well. And the, the the biggest consumer of all this information, of course, is analytics, which is just anything that goes into the message bus is siphoned into all of our analytics pipelines. And, and most of what I'm covering today doesn't even cover the stuff that the analytics teams use uh, inside of AWS as well. Uh, so that's another piece. Um, but I think the big part of, of focusing on, on the AWS uh, service aspect of this is that we, we kind of landed on uh, Chaos and Terraform. And Chaos is basically uh, an agnostic uh, mechanism to online uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and Terraform is a provisioning tool uh, from HashiCorp. Uh, and the, the subtlety between those two is 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 basically the specialization of, of what they're doing, uh, whereas Terraform is strictly provisioning in the sense that that is a, a state that it tries to achieve, not an orchestration that it tries to maintain. Uh, there's subtleties in the language there, but it, once you dig into them, it becomes a bit more obvious over time. But we, we wound up with these two technologies because we were we basically didn't want to become experts at the, I don't know, the 300 plus, however many millions of services AWS has nowadays. Um, we didn't want to become experts in all of those pieces. And so we kind of became the anti-experts in AWS and we're just looking for tools that allowed us to connect all of these pieces together. Um, and, and these are the, these two tools are kind of our, our bread and butter for, for those pieces, uh, of course, including things like cube control and those kind of things. And that kind of brings us to the, the minimalistic approach that we've taken to AWS, um, where we've, you know, we've talked about EC2 and, and RDS and, and where we use ElasticCache. Um, uh, ACM has been a huge part of this as well, which is the, uh, I think it's Amazon Certificate Manager. I'm not entirely sure what that acronym stands for off the top of my head, but it's Certificate Manager. It's either Amazon or Amazing. I don't know, whichever one. But basically we, we started using that to maintain all of our, our TLS termination and auto renewal of, of search and those kind of things. We were using uh, Let's Encrypt at some point in time. There's another piece on that coming later as well. Um, but also we've been over the S3 cloud front. I think the two other ones that are, are more managed that we that we use as opposed to everything else, like as far as the networking layer is concerned, is one of them is, is Global Accelerator. And that's how we maintain the connectivity or, or the lower latencies to the connectivity to things like, for instance, our chat server. So to get to each uh, from our actual Eve clients, uh, they're, they're going through Global Accelerator to, to achieve that. The other big part is Athena. Athena is uh, basically Amazon's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna oversell this. Uh, basically, their infinite database, the same way as S3 is their infinite hard drive. Uh, but we use Athena quite heavily to look at when we want to dig into specific uh, logs or events that have happened in a system. Um, for instance, if we if we have uh, when we're working a lot with our third-party developers, uh, you know, if they have something go sideways, we'll have, kind of look in there and see what the patterns are coming out of the of all of the HTTP requests that are coming in and, and those kind of things. Um, and so this is an example of, of one of the services that's running inside of our Kubernetes cluster um, and, then, and then feeding all the way back to the client. Uh, there's, a, there's a dev blog uh, in the bottom right that you guys can check out for more of the details on that and, and how that works. Um, and this is an example of, of how we're drawing the domain boundaries around what it is that we want to achieve 
and, and how do we extract that and isolate that in the sense that uh, we don't need to pull all this extra information with it. We don't need the definitions of the entire universe. We just need the part of the domain that we care about. Uh, so this became the first player facing uh, domain service that we had uh, with the, the, the adoption of, of, of AWS components. And so over the course of time, keep in mind, we started this journey probably three or four years ago. Uh, and so our, our, our adoption of protobuf led us down the path of gRPC. Uh, and then we, we just love the idea of all of that so much that we're just like, yeah, we, we want to lean into gRPC a bit more. And we started putting out uh, basically prototypes into the wild of connectivity and how we do this. And then we realized that once we hit gRPC and things like HTTP2, we were kind of surfing this wave a little bit ahead of what actually almost all cloud providers were providing at that point in time. Um, and so we started with, uh, to get connectivity to our players, we started with an elastic load balancer or also known as V1 or the classic load balancer. Um, and ultimately this is, uh, I think, Amazon's first iteration of, of load balancing in general, which is why you probably shouldn't be using it. Um, but the biggest problem immediately was that there was no HTTP2 support. So gRPC requires HTTP2, uh, also requires, uh, because of HTTP2, it also requires things like application level, uh, application layer uh, protocol negotiation, so ALPN, uh, to, a, to achieve TLS connections. Um, and so that added a whole bunch of things to the mix. Uh, and so we're like, oh, okay, well, they also have this thing called application load balancer. So the application load balancer is more about, um, when they say application here, they're thinking more about a, a RESTful service and, and how you deal with routing and, and, and uh, on that layer seven kind of uh, perspective of, of what you can do with those load balancers. Uh, and it has HTTP2 support. But then we started digging into that and then we found out it was this weird like reverse HTTP mullet where it was this, you know, HTTP2 party in the front, but multiplexed HTTP11 in the back. And that breaks gRPC or at least the features of gRPC that we wanted, which is bi-directional uh, streaming from the server. And so we basically at the time were like, fine, uh, we'll, we'll do TCP uh, and then we'll just terminate on the pods themselves. And so when we, when we started running into these limitations of what was happening at the time, because we're also communicating with AWS about these types of things, they're like, yeah, this is other stuff coming. And we're like, okay, great. Uh, and so what we did was we started implementing, uh, because we had to do the termination on the pods inside of Cube, because we couldn't do that on the load balancer, we started using uh, Let's Encrypt for all of our certificate management in those pieces uh, with all the fancy bells and whistles like zero hit, uh, search cycling and all those kind of things. Uh, but we did that in a sidecar because we ultimately knew that there were features coming along in AWS that would allow us just to delete that sidecar, reconfigure the load balancer, and we're, we'd still be working as normal when we eventually could push termination out further uh, in the stack. Um, and this is ultimately why we had to do that termination because there's no ALPN support in the TLS mechanisms inside the elastic load balancers. Um, and so again, kept with TCP uh, and then just forwarded that traffic through and terminated on the pods themselves. Then the glorious network load balancers came online from Amazon and we had all sorts of interesting options. Um, one of them was TLS with ALPN. We're like, awesome, great, let's use that. Uh, there were no Terraform uh, providers or cube controllers available to coordinate that or use that. Uh, this is actually pretty recent within the last three or four months, I believe. Um, and so we started looking at those pieces. Um, and then uh, there's some interesting bits that have to do with TLS target groups. Like if you wanna make sure the TLS goes all the way through to your targets, you don't necessarily need them. So the documentation is a little fuzzy on that, um, but we got this working the way we wanted to for now. And then at the end of a week, spending time figuring out how to do that, uh, basically the application load balancers got upgraded, I think, that was also that was literally within the last two or three weeks, uh, where application load balancers now fully support gRPC, HTTP2, all the way through with ALPN because application load balancers had ALPN support for quite some time. And so this kind of shows you the evolution of of, of what we went through over the course of uh, three or four years when we're working with with Amazon uh, to try to get connectivity for these services that were kind of on the bleeding edge, bleeding edge you know, quote unquote, HTTP2 kind of situations. Uh, because ultimately we don't want to maintain, like 
Let's Encrypt is awesome, but we don't want to maintain the controllers and the cycling and all the extra code that goes along with that to put that in our applications. We want to push that all out to like, just give us a load balancer that does all of the things that, that a load balancer should be doing. Yeah. And, but basically, <laughs> ultimately nothing on this slide is true anymore because the answer to this equation is, is the application load balancers uh, to use for, for gRPC purposes. Uh, again, that's pretty recent. And so, as we're working on the partitioning of all these pieces, we've been able to generate these different views of real time events happening in the universe itself. And so this is one of our toy projects that we have that's kind of showing the locational uh, events happening within the universe itself. And this is kind of interesting. This is what we have running at, at, at monitors at our office uh, when we get to go back to our office. Uh, but basically this allows us to see when players are moving large fleets through the universe or uh, there's uh, big fights going on somewhere and a lot of things are, you know, a lot of ships are exploding, those kind of things. Um, and so all of this comes together to allow us to kind of look at what this uh, universe is doing, uh, even though it's partitioned, we can look at it in a unified perspective. And so when we get into evolving uh, the universe and kind of what we want to do next, uh, ultimately we look at this from the EVE client perspective, and this is, this is basically the, the start bar, for lack of a better term, in our, in our EVE client, we call it the Neocom. And in the Neocom, you have all of these, these services that you can interact with. One of them is EVE mail. Um, and what we'd like to do is, because we're moving out of this monolithic structure and all of these pieces and moving into all these AWS uh, cube containers, all these other pieces, we want to be able to say, hey, EVE mail's offline, uh, because right now, when something goes terribly wrong, it's basically we disconnect all of our clients, or some of them. Anyway, it's not a good experience for our users. And so that's kind of, one of the overarching goals of, of kind of why we're partitioning the universe this way is so that we can break these pieces off because not only does it separate concerns of that ecosystem it also allows developers to move at different speeds uh, and work on pieces without worrying about a chain reaction in the in the grander scheme of things as we move forward this is ultimately the the layout that we want to see uh, so I've, I've oversimplified the original architecture diagram on the left side with our, our data center, the souls, the proxies, and the router at the, as the front door, and that connectivity that we have from our data center to RabbitMQ and the VPC and AWS, and then basically have all of these go through Global Accelerator uh, into the ALB, into Kubernetes for the actual services that are doing the work uh, for the universe. And this means that we're going to introduce an actual secondary connection to the EVE Online client, which will be gRPC to those uh, to those gateways that get us into the more interesting bits on the message bus. And over time, we will be trying to move as much from the proprietary TCP protocol that we have into gRPC that gets us into that ubiquitous language because everything that we move over, uh, again, moves into the ubiquitous language, which means we can build more and more features on top of this, which kind of goes back to what Adagni was talking about in the introduction, where you know, we can start leveraging more of these services around uh, the AI mechanisms, uh, the machine learning pieces of, of what the, the cloud providers can really give to us because we have a central place where we can source all that information and not have to worry about accidentally kicking over our primary cluster. Um, so the other things that we're looking at in those cases are, are, are more managed services. I think when me and Arugni were prepping this presentation, he literally sent me a link to uh, Amazon now has a RabbitMQ, a managed RabbitMQ instance. Um, and so that might be something that we look at in the future. Uh, but there is another tricky part about this, and this is something I haven't mentioned up to this point, but a lot of the things that dictated the minimalistic approach was also because we're publishing in China as well with a separate server. And AWS's presence in China almost has parity with all the services in the rest of the world. Uh, and so uh, my, my first question to I think every time you every time he presents me with a new service that Amazon has that we might be able to use, like RabbitMQ, my first question is, is it available in China? And it, of course, it's almost always no, because unless it's a, unless it's a drop in upgrade of some existing service, it, it's usually not the case. Um, so we might have to wait a little bit while uh, for RabbitMQ because ultimately we don't want to adopt any services that would make one of our two primary production servers a snowflake. Uh, of course, there's going to be some degree of uniqueness between those two, but we try to reduce that percentage as much as, much as possible. Um, one of the other things that, you know, is kind of the elephant in the room is that, you know, why are we using KOps and not EKS? 
Um, I think the big part about this is that we need we've needed to control the lower the lower level concepts of Cube for a very long time because one we grew up with Cube growing up as well. I think we adopted Cube right after 1.0. Uh, and that was in our own data centers and that evolved into other cloud providers. And then we finally wound up in, in AWS in that case. But through that uh, through that growth, we understand Cube a lot better now. We understand what should be in it and what shouldn't be in it. Um, and, and part of those were bringing in, you know, learning from, you know, pulling out things like search, for example, and having indexers put in Cube and then realizing we have to have massive amounts of memory for the indexers to deal with they're pulling from a five terabyte database to try to index into an Elasticsearch cluster. All, all of these kind of things that we learned along the way. But as we move forward with all of these pieces, you know, we 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 still have to, you know, go back to the original idea of like we, we don't want to be experts in all of these things. At some point, we will say, okay, EKS has gotten to the point where we can trust that, you know, we don't have to care about the masters anymore. We don't have to care about how they do rolling upgrades. We don't have to care about the CNI, the nuances to the CNIs. Um, and then we can just let them deal with all those pieces because also, you know, again, riding that wave earlier with, with GRPC has kind of shown us that, you know, it takes time for the cloud providers to gain that actual expertise as well and formalize that in the sense of like, this is ready to be used. And so in the, in the future, this is definitely something that we'll come back to uh, and maybe we'll, we'll, you know, throw away our, our chaos expert hats at some point. Um, the other interesting concepts that we've had, uh, and this is all theory crafting at this point in time, is the concept of battle service, which Agni was kind of referring to in the introduction as well, where you know we get into this concept of, for us, we've been talking about like the fact that Eve isn't really a session-based game. It's not like I'm not, I'm, we're not matchmaking 18 or 16 v 16 match uh, or like a battle royale and put everybody on the same server. That's not really how that works. Uh, this is the universe. And it's a sandbox game. Anybody can be anywhere at any point in time. Um, and <laughs> our players choose to usually be in the same place at the same time as much as possible. Um, if you <laughs> reference back to our recent like Guinness world record of, of people, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a simulation uh, space battle. Uh, I think we were around somewhere around 6,800 players at once uh, in the same battle, um, but it might be off uh, by a few hundred there. Uh, but the idea being is that, you know, we can't, again, lift and shift directly into the cloud, right? We, we can't just take what's there without taking parts of it uh, and then isolating them. So the, the battle server concept is this idea that because of Eve's origins and, and how like everything is, is based on MSSQL and that's where the bread and butter is, like those procs are the reality of the universe. Um, we, we have this theory crafted idea about, okay, well, what if, what if the, the ownership of that information moves when people go into space? And that, the thing that's simulating that part of space then owns all the data for those people in that part of space. And the beautiful part about that is, is it means that we can push all that data onto the message bus onto an EC2 instance and say, okay, you own everybody that's around this moon, like this grid in space is you own all the information there. And whenever that, that player or that data comes to a state of rest, then we can persist it again. Or if that, you know, uh, unfortunately that, that node dies or whatever the case may be, we can either try to migrate it off or persist it somewhere or roll back, right? Um, and so this is, this is kind of the place that we we want to get to with, with the decoupling mechanism uh, as far as the as opposed to the cohesion parts uh, of the the domain boundaries when it try to get to the places where we can use more of the uh, the, the toolbox that AWS has uh, and isolating those pieces um, and again this is this is <laughs> theory crafting stuff because up until this point a lot of our plans and the in the midterm plans right now are to basically clear the table of all of the services in the universe, not the simulation in the universe. Um, and that, that gives us, you know, that gives us one more headroom uh, in our primary data center to toy with simulation and what it can and can't do. Um, I mean, we already have some special cases where we reinforce, uh, we call it node reinforcement, which is basically we isolate the simulation of a location, a solar system location to a specific uh, beefy machine in the data center itself. But we could break that down into bigger primitives because right now Eve's primary primitive is a solar system, uh, which means if there's two big battles going on in that solar system, they will affect one another. It's, it's definitely a noisy neighbor in the solar system. Uh, but if we can break these these domain boundaries down to the point of having a battle server, we can actually isolate that to who's on the visible grid in space. Uh, 
the other thing that kind of invalidates the the tail of, of gRPC and the three load balancers is we want to move to quick and HTTP three. Um, and this gets back into uh, trying to work with latency and routing problems that some of our players see. Um, but also it's it's the it's going to be the progression of how gRPC works under the hood. Um, and so that's the next conversation that we're having with AWS and like what does the connectivity look like and what <laughs> What does the support for the load balancers look like in that sense when that's coming along in, the, in those pieces? Um, and that's also a switch from TCP to UDP, and there's, there's also sort of the interesting uh, nuances there as well. Um, but ultimately, this gets us to a place where we can have some kind of replay resilience in our clients right now, because at the moment, uh, uh, the original architecture of EVE Online is, is, is you have to be uh, in sync with the, the simulation. There's basically a proxy simulation on the client, and the server keeps uh, uh, frames, up, uh, key frames up to date, so to speak. Uh, it's not necessarily a lockstep, but it it can't. It, it has some margin of error that can correct itself, but if there's too much delta, it just can't uh, cope with that. Uh, but we'd like to get to that point when we start introducing these pieces and potentially combine that with the concepts of the battle servers. Uh, but again, these are all uh, R and D things that we're that we're still talking about on paper at this point in time. I think uh, Nick, I you know, awesome to hear about the the future, what's happening. Uh, I think unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. So um, yeah, yeah. Well, any last words on yeah. Phoenix? That, I mean, that's the last slide. So perfect. Um, and and <laughs> that's basically covering kind of how we've adopted uh, AWS in those services in those scenarios. Awesome. Uh, super interesting to hear this journey. Obviously, uh, with with uh, Eve Online having been around for so long, uh, it comes with a lot of complexities in terms of how do you how do you do this. I, I would love to spend 20 more minutes and dig into some of these aspects. But uh, <laughs> thank you so much for for joining me on on uh, this talk and and sharing the story of of Eve Online and CCP. Yeah, and, no problem. Uh, thanks to everybody who's who who joined us. Yeah, thanks guys. See you later. Bye.